welcome back to another episode of the podcast. If you are watching today on YouTube, you will see I have a little guest with me. Spoiler alert, if you are listening on audio, it is Simba. He has decided to come and cuddle me for the start of this recording today. I feel like it's maybe going to be a bit of a shorter recording. I'm feeling quite tired and I just wanted to kind of do this recording following on from the last one and a lot of the things that I mentioned today might be things that I have brought up in other episodes or you have heard me say something similar and I guess why I'm doing this episode today is oh Simba's away down already. Why I'm doing this episode today is just to kind of bring that all together. Um, pardon me. This is quite personal for me to be honest and it does build off of my last episode about the road trip across the west of Scotland. If you listen to that you'll know that I had a really good experience with my friend who went out of his way to help me with my chair getting it in and out of the car especially with the wheel being broken and even when I was kind of getting upset and worrying that my disability was impacting his experience he was um, very reassuring that he's not got the most patience and a lot of the times it's very visible on his face and I can say that I've not really seen that when dealing with my wheelchair so that is like something that's nice um however it is very frustrating when there are barriers to accessibility and I think being away with somebody it was a reminder of how much these feelings can weigh on me and despite all of my efforts to find peace with them they're still kind of there and today I kind of want to dig a bit deeper I want to talk about where these feelings of shame and inadequacy come from it is a story that kind of goes back a bit to my childhood touches on kind of dynamics the path that I took into nursing and ultimately then having my accident. It is about how disability and shame are intertwined, not just by the physical limitations, but also by emotional responses from family, friends, society. Through this, I want to share a little bit about what it takes to kind of unlearn those feelings and begin to embrace acceptance. To start, I am going to go back to when I had my first, when I first had my accident. For those who might not know, I had a serious car accident in 2019 that led to years of surgeries, two different frames and a battle with chronic pain and infections. I honestly thought that once my leg was fixed, I would just go back to normal. I expected that I would recover and life would resume as usual, but the truth was, as things progressed, it became very clear that my life was going to look really different. Even then, right away, I never saw myself as disabled initially. It probably took until getting my second frame, uh, the bone infection and ultimately getting my leg amputated that I started to realise that this is my life now. I am disabled and for a long time that was really hard for me to accept. I felt shame, honestly. I worried about what people would think, how would they see me, would I be perceived as damaged goods, would people avoid me or treat me differently. This fear really became a part of my 
daily reality further back than the accident. This shame didn't just start when I lost my leg. It has been lingering for as long as I can remember and realistically at a point where I couldn't point out what shame was really. Um, I grew up in a home where survival meant constant vigilance, productivity and often silence. I felt like my worth was directly tied to what I could do, how productive I could be. I have spoke about it a few times that I was raised in what people would politely put it as a tough household where we were expected to work hard and contribute even as children from DIY projects um, to scrubbing nicotine off of walls, the conservatory, unblocking gutters. It felt like my value was really measured in how much I got done, especially when it came to times where we weren't allowed to go to bed until we had done what needed to be done and at times I would cry because I was just so shattered but I felt like I wasn't good enough because I was getting upset and I should have been able to do it but looking back now I can realise that I was a child and of course I was tired because I thought that this was normal, rest was never really a priority and it was something that I felt really guilty for. I feel like this did kind of start planting those seeds of shame into every aspect of my life before I even really knew what shame was and then even longer until I could identify that that's what this feeling was because I thought that if I wasn't contributing then yeah I must be a burden. There was violence in my house particularly directed towards my mum. There was a lot of emotional psychological manipulation that was directed towards me and my brother. The intensity of that environment when I was young taught me to stay on very high alert to always be useful to try to predict what is going to happen next so that I'm already doing something and I can't be in trouble for not doing something if that kind of makes sense. I, I didn't want to draw attention to myself and I wanted to try and cover all bases so that there was no kind of trigger for conflict. It was almost like being productive became my armour at times where I was struggling the most. I would be upstairs in my room studying and I was absolutely gutted when I failed my exams because I didn't understand that I'd put so much work into this but it, was, it wasn't going into my brain. I was just doing it so that I was doing something because if I wasn't doing something then who knows what might happen and that just kept me in this cycle of fear I would say it's it was more than a habit it was a survival mechanism even when I eventually moved out on my own that anxiety really stayed with me and when I was struggling I would be on the floor scrubbing the carpets trying to make everything as clean as possible and that somehow by me being clean and keeping myself productive it would avoid disaster that was going to happen but then I was still waking up and having panic attacks days at a time and I couldn't understand because I'm trying to do something and why are all of these things that I'm trying to do not working? My body would be in full panic mode, convinced that something was going to happen if I didn't keep myself constantly occupied. For years, I saw my value through this very tightly scoped 
lens. I described it to my therapist the other week as almost feeling like I had tunnel vision and we looked at like the body's psychological way of anxiety and fight or flight and one of the main things is tunnel vision. I felt purpose laid in hard work and always being of service and that meant that I would people please to the extreme and not really understand fully who I was at my core and then in turn I felt even more undeserving of love because surely when I start to be myself and they see parts of myself they're not going to like me for who I am because all I'm doing right now is to make them like me. It felt like it was never enough I guess. Nursing became the ultimate way to me to prove myself that I could be useful and help others and it did feel like my calling not just a career but I felt like it really was my purpose in life and I have said this is why I said initially that I feel like there's going to be quite a few things that I have said throughout previous episodes but I kind of wanted to put it into the one because I guess it's it's hard to talk about shame sometimes like if you're watching on the YouTube channel, you will see that my hands are going crazy and I'm stimming and I'm doing all of these hand movements because it is quite difficult to talk about. So bear with me. I know it might be a bit rambly in some parts, but I'm trying. Looking back, I can see the warning signs when it came to nursing because nursing is a very demanding career especially for someone who is driven by the need to prove their worth through constant action I uh, threw myself into the job to the point of exhaustion and on top of that I was working outside of uni outside of placement in a care job where I was then throwing myself into things even more. I didn't really give myself a chance to stop and my third year I ended up meaning that I was off like one day a week and even then I still had my job calling me and say oh can you just work a Sunday and it was between that of saying okay I bend over backwards for you and work an extra day and it means that then I work 13 days in a row and I don't get a day off I actually don't know if I can do that and I think that's the only point where I kind of stopped and was like hmm I do need some rest and sometimes I really do wonder what would have happened if I hadn't had the accident if I would have kept pushing myself beyond limits until something else gave way especially with a global pandemic and the demand that was on health workers. The accident really changed everything for me. It stripped me of my old idea of productivity forcing me to redefine who I was without this constant busyness, without physical ability to keep up the place and everything had changed suddenly I was no longer in control and I found myself dependent on people in ways that I had never imagined and the reality of facing a physical trauma like this is extremely difficult to explain to people who haven't gone through it honestly some people don't want to understand it that's a harsh truth but it's something that many of us experience. Family members and friends often struggle to truly grasp the challenges that a person who has underwent serious physical and mental trauma are going through. They might be quite uncomfortable facing what has happened and that was something in my recovery where I felt like... I'm going through this but so are they and that's also hard for them. <sighs> My accident was a moment that shattered so many things that I had clung to for years and I had no idea how to 
put all of those pieces back together? How do you put parts together when there's no image to strive for? It was almost like a 5,000 piece puzzle that was just one solid colour and there is no direction on where to put these pieces other than looking at where they're broken and try to slot into each other. <sighs> I think that's how it felt in those very early moments and even at some parts now, since my accident, I have been through quite a few identity crises, crises, crises? I think that's the right pronunciation, where I needed people who understood me to remind me of my core values, the things that don't change, the things that have maybe been heightened and more confident I get, those had been things that had been dampened down at a point and I guess after the accident I didn't have the capacity to dampen things down. I made jokes quite a few times that I must have hit my head because I was being so blunt. In hindsight now I can see that I could no longer mask and put down all of the things that I'd kind of been on autopilot for years. Living with disability and chronic pain comes this weird cycle of grief. There's this ongoing sense of loss, not just for what I physically lost, but for the person that I was. And honestly, every time that I think I've processed that grief, something new brings it back up. I think that it's something that's been really difficult for me to understand and in terms come to accept that this isn't just something that I go through once but it's something that might stay with me my whole life. I thought that at the beginning of my accident that grief would be a one and done process that I would just have to, I just need to look at this one thing and it's done. I should have realised after the grief that I feel for losing my childhood, it isn't just something that comes up once, it is something that comes in waves. Some days those waves are heavier than others. It has been really difficult for me to come to terms with it, that it's okay for me to feel this way and I guess that if you are listening to this and you are going through a journey with your own disability or chronic illness, I hope that you know that it's okay to feel that loss, be angry and be sad and be scream and upset. You are not alone in any of that because it is a really tough process to go through and whatever you need to do to get through it, you need to do to get through it. I do think that it is really interesting how other people's perceptions can shape our journeys to acceptance. For a really long time I felt like a burden. That came from a lot of experiences with family, with friends, with people around me. It is hard to talk about but there were moments where I felt like my disability wasn't really seen as a part of me. It was seen as an inconvenience. And although sometimes things were said with a well-meaning attitude, it often made things worse. People around me sometimes acted like pushing me in my wheelchair was a chore. There were sighs or rolling of eyes or little remarks, though small and maybe meant to be a joke. It seemed like I was a problem to be managed. There are even times where I have been reduced to the wheelchair rather than being seen as a person in a wheelchair. And comments like this might seem harmless to the people that are saying them, but they hit really differently when you're always already feeling extremely raw and vulnerable. It internalises this idea that I was a burden, that because I'm disabled, I'm less than. While meant to be encouraging, these comments sometimes reinforce the idea that I was supposed to carry my burden in silence, that 
my struggles were a sign of my strength and not something that needed to be more deeply understood. Families, support circles can sometimes fall into these patterns thinking that they're helping when they're actually placing even more pressure on someone who is already trying to adjust to disability. They want you to be okay so badly that they might ignore the depth of what you're going through and turn your pain into a cry for help instead of an experience that deserves to be unpackaged and supported. I do feel like a lot of people that have seen my recovery have the perception that after I had my leg amputated that all of my pain just disappeared. That is because I am very visibly disabled when not having my prosthetic with one leg because I do want to try and live life in the most beautiful ways possible and I feel like that is sometimes seen that I'm no longer hurting but I have been in pain every single day since I had my accident. Even when I'm on medication on good days when I feel like my pain is well managed I am still probably sitting at a 3 out of 10 on the pain scale. That's because it's chronic pain. Even putting my wheelchair in and out of the car, it causes aches and pains in my body, using a wheelchair that's too small for me. Walking with my prosthetic on, yeah, I might look able, I might have a bit of a limp. You might see my prosthetic or my walking aids, but you don't see the pain receptors firing off in my body that are in agony. I do feel like I carry those things well, but it doesn't mean that there's not some days where that weight is extremely heavy and it starts impacting me to the point where I can't do the things I want to do. And I think it is so important for support circles to learn and listen without trying to offer solutions or platitudes. I think I want to kind of pause for a minute and think about why this shame exists in the first place. Internalised ableism is the idea that people with disabilities may adopt negative societal beliefs about themselves simply because they live in a world that was not built for them. We are told in subtle and not and sometimes not so subtle ways that disability is something to be pitied, fixed or overcome. The world celebrates independence, self-sufficiency and strength. The world celebrates independence, self-sufficiency and strength, but disability doesn't easily fit into these moulds, so we're often made to feel like we're failing in, in some way. Shame gets worse when the people around us unintentionally reinforce these beliefs. They might say things like, you're such an inspiration for getting out of bed today, or I just don't know how you do it. Whilst these are statements that can be well-meaning, they highlight how much our society fixates on physical ability. When you're the one hearing these things day in and day out, it is easy to feel like you're different, like you're less than somehow. If you are someone who supports or loves somebody with a disability, a family member, and you are listening to this podcast, you might wonder what is helpful and what isn't. So here are a few things that can unintentionally create shame and perpetuate ableism, even if you're coming from a place of love. Overemphasizing inspiration. Statements like, you're stro so strong or I could never do what you're doing can feel isolating. It's a way of separating a disabled person as somehow other or not part of normal life. Implying dependence as a negative. Comments about how work it, how much work it takes to help someone, sighs or groans whilst related to tasks about their disability can make people feel like a burden. Minimising feelings. Avoid saying things like, it could be worse, you're so lucky compared to others. It can make us feel like we are not allowed to feel frustrated or upset about our circumstances. 
not making adjustments or including us. Small things like not having accessible spaces in the home or planning activities that don't accommodate us sends a message that we are not fully included. It reinforces that our disability is a problem or an inconvenience. What are some things that you might want to say instead to support somebody on their journey to acceptance? Here are a few simple but powerful ways that might help. Be present, no pressure. Just be there without pushing or forcing independence can be huge. A simple, I'm here if you need anything, can really go a long way. Normalise assistance. Rather than making a big deal out of help, treat it as a part of life. Letting us know you're available without judgement is incredibly validating. Respect autonomy. Ask us about our preferences for getting out and about rather than assuming. Including us in decision making reminds us that we are still in control of our lives even if we need help. For someone who is newly disabled or dealing with physical trauma, one of the most powerful things a loved one can say is, I am here and I'll walk beside you on this journey no matter how messy it is. That kind of support genuine and without expectations can make all of the difference. I had a partner say to me at one point that I wasn't going to be like this forever and my response was, well what if I am? He had told me that it didn't matter but in times of struggle when you're already feeling vulnerable it feels like that person expects you to be so much better and perhaps no longer disabled and that just isn't realistic. I have good days but at the end of them I'm still disabled and that means that bad days can come out of nowhere and it can be extremely exhausting to not know when that might happen. My life is directed because of my disability. If I push myself and I'm already running on empty then I end up causing myself more harm so I need to think about what I'm doing. In contrast my friend who I went on the road trip with really reminded me of what acceptance could look like and I have already mentioned this a few times where people have lifted me up and shown me support where I felt accepted fully as a person, disability and all. My friend understood the difficulties of travelling with a wheelchair, even one that was falling apart, and they never made me feel like a hassle or a burden. When we hit accessibility barriers, they didn't sigh or seem put out. They simply adjusted our plans and even found ways to make me laugh about it. At one point, when I was on the verge of a meltdown due to a lack of accessible bathrooms, they had hugged me and helped me problem solve in a way that showed me they genuinely cared about my experiences. And this kind of support can be quite eye-opening for me because it shows me that while I need to ask for help or even reassurance that doesn't make me weak or any less independent. Sometimes it feels like a small act to ask for a bit of encouragement but it can be really terrifying when you've grown up believing that independence equals worth, that I need to do everything on my own. There are new things that pop up where I need support or I need reassurance and my trauma rears its head and I feel like I need to do it all on my own. But I've also got to a point that I can recognise when those negative feelings are cropping up and sometimes I can let them be or sometimes I need to voice them and ask the person I'm with for a bit of reassurance and that's okay too. One thing that has helped me more than I expected is connecting more with the disabled community. For a long time, I feel like I tried to prove that I was still quote-unquote normal in some kind of way, whatever that means, and that I didn't need any special help or accommodations and I could do it all on my own. 
but this community taught me that needing assistance, whether it's a hug on a hard day or help lifting my wheelchair, it doesn't make me any less than. Instead, it's actually an acknowledgement of my reality and there is a massive amount of strength inside of that. It is really critical to understand that the disabled community isn't here to provide inspiration porn for able-bodied people. It is for us, the people with lived experience, to connect, to empathise and to find understanding in one another. It's for sharing those days when everything is a bit too much and knowing that others have actually been there too. They get it, the frustration, the hurt the victories, whether they're big or small. The beauty of the disabled community is the way that it creates a space where I can process my feelings without judgment. I can find people to lean on for support and no one feels pressured to perform wellness or resilience unless they actually genuinely feel it. Over time, I have worked really hard to try and move away from shame, but it is a journey and it is one that's ongoing and at this moment, I don't know if it'll be something that is ongoing for the rest of my life where there are parts of myself that I find shame in that I never even knew existed. But accepting disability is... For me, at least, a continuous cycle of grease, grease, of grief, loss and acceptance. There are days where I have to remind myself that rest is okay, that my worth is not determined by how productive I am. In fact, taking that rest is essential for my mental and physical well-being. I've learned that it is okay to let go of people and influences that reinforce shame, even if they are family. It has been freeing to surround myself with people who get it, who don't make a big deal out of helping me when I need it and don't put me on a pedestal just because I'm managing life with a disability. Those are relationships that help keep me going. It is a complex, ongoing process, but each and every single day, I try to remind myself that my value does not lie in how much I can do or how many people I can help, but my worth is inherent, just as it is for every other disabled person. I really hope that today, by sharing these experiences, that I can show others who are struggling with similar feelings of shame or internalised ableism that you aren't alone. If you are listening and you have felt the weight of other people's expectations or your own internalised judgments, please know that there's a path forward. It is okay to ask for help, to take things slowly and to also ask for compassion along the way. And for friends and families listening, I do really encourage you to let your loved one's journeys unfold naturally. Support them without trying to fix everything. Listen without judgment. Show up for them as they are and not how you think they should be. I really want to thank you for joining me and listening to today's episode. I hope that sharing this journey really ho helps you to better understand the way of internalised shame and the power of acceptance. And remember, you are never a burden, whether you need a wheelchair lift, a hug, or a bit of extra time to process. Please stay safe, be kind to yourselves. If you have anything you would like to tell me, please drop me an email to cripplechroniclespod at gmail.com. I think I forgot it in the intro, so if you want to follow me on socials, that is also at Cripple Chronicles Pod. I hope that you are looking after yourselves this festive season, and I'll hopefully see you in a few weeks' time. Bye!